Welcome to Open Window. Thanks for joining us. This is a program about people, politics, and places that are a part of Brockton. And today we're very privileged to have with us Representative Claire Cronin from the 11th Plymouth District. So welcome. Thanks, welcome. Wynn. I, the uh, counselor. Thank you very much. Uh, whatever possessed you to get into the rough and tumble world of politics? I know you grew up in Brockton, but take us from there. Okay, yeah, I did grow up in Brockton. I, I'm sure a lot of people are well aware that my uncle was the mayor of Brockton back in the 1950s. So I grew up in a family where we uh, celebrated uh, the desire to serve the public. And I, I knew from what he did, the good that could come from serving in government. Uh, so as a child, I, it was always interesting to me. I always worked on campaigns uh, for many of our local officials uh, as I grew up. I studied political science at Stonehill College. That was my major. I went on to law school. And so it, it was a natural uh, fit for me. Uh, but it, prior to that, I had always been very involved in our community, serving on the board of the Old Colony Y, uh, and Easton on Foundation for Educational Excellence, the Charity Guild in Brockton. And, uh, my desire to serve was always there, and uh, there's no better way to do it, I think, than to be so fortunate uh, to serve in the House of Representatives. Well, you've, you've done a couple of interesting things, and one is you gave up a lucrative law practice to become, a, literally, a full-time legislator. And a lot of people play both professions into the other, but you chose not to do that. Right. And uh, any regrets? Has it made it a little easier to undertake the legislative duties? No, I have no regrets. I mean, I, th I think I, I wanted to do that for a lot of reasons. I wanted balance. Uh, I felt if I were trying to handle my law practice and working as a state representative that neither one would have my full attention. And, you know, I just wanted to devote myself fully to this. So and, no regrets And we're in, we're in third term, correct? Third term, Third yes. term. And you have been chosen to be chair of the Judiciary Committee, which is a first for a couple of reasons. One, I think, is because of seniority. The legislature is a very seniority-driven place, and, uh, and you became chair. But there's another reason why that's so, uh, so important. Uh, so expound on that a little bit for us. I think what Wynne is referring to is that I, I was selected as the first woman to ever chair the House Judiciary Committee. So... You know, that's something that, it's a first, and, you know, something that my daughters like to talk about, and uh, so I am the first woman chair. And interestingly enough, uh, the ranking minority member, she Representative Sheila Harrington, uh, is also the first uh, woman minority, uh, ranking minority member on the committee as well. So that's a big first. Now, for the people that don't know anything about committees in the legislature, what does the Judiciary Committee do? Just give us an idea of the different types of issues that would come before you. Sure. Uh, well, the Judiciary Committee, uh, with the exception of Ways and Means, is the, when I say the biggest committee, it's not the biggest, but it's the committee that handles the most bills. So in an average legislative session, there are probably uh, 5,000 bills that are filed. Almost 20% of those are assigned to the Judiciary Committee, so the volume on that committee is greater than any other committee. There are 38 committees, so if you do the math on that, and if 20% of the bills are in one committee and the other bills all fall into 37 other committees, you know, it's considered a busy committee. It's considered a committee that has uh, some of the most controversial bills come before the Judiciary Committee, a lot of times very emotional issues. Uh, we touch on everything from uh, civil rights, uh, every aspect of our judicial system, the courts, so whether it be uh, laws related to child custody, alimony, uh, civil rights, uh, civil law, uh, traffic, motor vehicle laws, it all seems to come to the Judiciary Committee. Animal rights, that too. I mean, the, it, there's just a wide range of topics that come before this committee. But and, the numbers are staggering. <laughs> and, and you have a staff to manage too. I mean, it's not just the volume of work coming in. You have people to manage to make sure that the bills are addressed properly and they're scheduled for hearing. And so, uh, never lose there, a bill. <laughs> uh, yeah, never lose a bill. How many staff members? 
Um, I have my staff director, which many people in Brockton know, uh, Stephanie Fleming. Uh, she was with me before I became uh, chair of judiciary, and she has come on as the staff director for the whole staff. Amelia Ribello, my legislative aide. Uh, most of the people around Brockton and Easton have met her as well. And she's a recent Stonehill College grad. And so uh, Stephanie is as well. So we're employing locally. Uh, Stonehill so, has a great representation, I can yes, see, on, uh, yes, they on do. what's going on. So. Um, and uh, beyond that, we have a, a gentleman from Brockton, Phil McLaughlin. Uh, no relation, although my maiden name was McLaughlin. And uh, he just graduated from UMass Boston. He's our research director. And then in addition to that, we have uh, three staff lawyers. Well, you undertook with others uh, what you've described as a 40-year uh, review of yeah. the criminal justice system in Massachusetts. And uh, obviously, that's fascinating to me because I retired from law enforcement. And yeah. criminal justice has a lot of different components. But take us to the point where suddenly there is this bill. It's before your committee. You're the chair of that committee, and you really had to extend yourself to get this work done. So let, let's go through that process okay. a little bit about the bill comes in, and now you've got to decide how to handle it. Okay. So <clears throat> I'll have to take you back a little. Uh, Eighteen months before the session began, uh, the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, the Governor, and Paula Carey, who is the Chief Justice of the Trial Court, wrote a letter to the Council of State Governments asking them to review our criminal justice laws and make some recommendations to us as the experts you know, on criminal justice laws throughout the country. Yes. So as a result, there was a working group established. And as a result of that 18-month study, the Council for State Governments came up with several suggestions on how we could improve our laws, some that you know, dealt with mandatory minimum sentences, some dealt with data collection and interpretation of the data or the like. And at the end of that, there was a four-way agreement between the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, uh, the Governor, and the, and the courts, where they came up with a piece of legislation, which is called the CSG legislation. We kind of refer to it that way yeah. in the House. Um, and what that did was established um, programming for uh, reentry into society. You know, if we have people who are in prison and then they come out and once they have done their time, they come out into back to our communities, back to our neighbors, neighborhoods to provide them with access to treat more treatment, uh, more support systems when they come out. Uh, but prior to that, there has been a push for many, many years. Uh, to reform other aspects of our criminal justice system. Uh, from the time when a person first enters it, which might be as a juvenile, up until the time a person may be dying in prison. The whole... So everything gets kind of dumped in into between. one uh, yeah. pot and, the, and the whole, stirred up. And the whole <clears> gamut. <throat> so the CSG bill was filed, uh, but there was a feeling that it didn't quite go far enough and that there was much more for us to do. And that's where I came in. Uh, so at that point in time, after I became uh, named chair, it was not one bill, and that's, that's something that sometimes people think it's one bill. It ends up as one bill, yeah. uh, but it started out as a, more than a, a hundred and, I think we had 112 oh boy. separate bills relating to criminal justice. All filed by different people who have their own particular interests. Everyone has their own interest. It could be that you have an interest in juvenile law, or it could be you have an interest in sentencing, but there were 112 bills filed. Uh, with those 112 bills, every bill had to have a hearing. Uh, so we had hours and hours and hours of hearings uh, where people came in and testified both for and su in support of these bills, uh, opposing some of these bills. And at the end of that time, after the hearings, we did those hearings probably uh, mostly last June. I mean, we had most of the hearings on that bill, I believe, last June. And then all summer, it was go through the bills, read them, read the testimony. I mean, we have hun I, not hundreds, thousands of pages of testimony and research that go behind the bill. So you'd take something of this bill, something of that bill, something of this bill, because obviously you need the support of the legislators to, to pass this and try to mix it into one right. 
dynamic piece of legislation that hopefully keeps everyone happy. Right, and therein lies the challenge. <laughs> so in the <coughs> House of Representatives, we have 160 members, uh, all from different districts, different needs. You know, we have uh, some representatives who represent urban districts, might have a position that might be very different from a rep that is in a small town in Western Mass where maybe there is little crime or, you know, but we all come to it from a different place. Uh, so we, what I wanted to do as chair is make sure that when we did come up with a final bill in the House, that it was one that refre reflected the priorities of all of the members. Uh, so through that process, what we did is um, I sent out a re written request to every member of the House asking them to come and meet with me. So I met with over 100 individual members of the House uh, where they could come in with their bills, explain to me what was important to them. Uh, in addition to that, I mean, I met with over 100 members, but there's an awful lot of people out there that have a lot to say about criminal justice. So we met with the DAs, we met with the criminal defense attorneys, we met with people who uh, work with mental health, people who work with children, parole offices, probation offices. So one of the byproducts are that you've really established some great relationships that will carry over to the future work of the of the Committee on Judiciary as well then. So I you, think so. Yeah, I mean, I I mean it, was a, it, it was, it was <laughs> defini definitely um, a very collaborative process. Uh, I think a lot of people were very happy uh, that they had the chance to weigh in. Uh, we met with so many stakeholders, whether it be um, people that work at, for the Department of Correction from EOPS. You're very, yeah. quite familiar yeah. with that department. Uh, district okay. attorneys, you know, just uh, former prisoners, family members, mothers who have lost their children to gun violence. I mean, the amount of people, uh, church groups uh, in Brockton, you know, we definitely met with you know, organizations like co uh, members of Coalition for Social Justice, Brockton Interfaith Group, yep. uh, people that work with uh, troubled youth uh, at the YMCA. Yep. Uh, the list goes on and on. Mental health professionals. and Mental health yeah. professionals, you know, because what all of these people bring to the table is real life experience. An academic can, you know, sit and tell you about the teenage brain and why we need to raise the age of juvenile justice. Uh, but it's always good to talk to the people that are in the trenches yes. and in the courts, the clerks, you know, the whole gamut. Yeah. And we did, and it was uh, quite a process. Well, that, that's kind of a great segue into the key, key components of what the reform bill did. So you must have four or five that really stick out as being quite landmark in, mm -hmm. in the changes in the system. So in no particular order, tell us, tell us some of them. Okay, yeah. sure. Uh, what we tried to do is look at where a person life may intersect with our criminal justice so system. So we started at the beginning with juveniles and we went right through at every step of the way. So it could be, you know, a child might come into our criminal justice system, you know, eight years old, seven years old. Yeah. Prior to this bill, a seven year old could be charged with a crime and actually incarcerated, believe it or not, yeah. uh, right up till the time a person potentially dies in prison or maybe, you know, seeks compassionate release. So we touched on every aspect. So it would start with um, juveniles. Uh, then we have this emerging adult age. You know, there was a very big push to raise the age of our juvenile court system uh, to 19. We did not do that. We didn't do that in the House bill. Uh, they did do that in the Senate bill, but the final bill remained at 18, same as the House. Uh, but we recognized that some of the uh, 18 to 21 year olds, we'll call them emerging d adults, have yes. different yeah. brain development. Yeah. Uh, we didn't believe it was appropriate to take them out of the juvenile system, but we recognized that there were programs that may be targeted to that age group. Uh, and we, for the first time, allowed for uh, expungement of a very limited number of uh, juvenile or, or um, criminal records for the 18 to 21 year olds, not, uh, not any that involve crimes of serious bodily injury or that type thing. But you know, you do have a, a person that maybe 18, 19 makes a mistake 
one mistake. Yeah. Shoplifting or something, some nonviolent crime. And, and, you know, make one mistake and then they carry it with them for their life. And that's, you know, certainly a barrier to a lot of things. You know, it could be a felony conviction uh, where, you know, we used to have the, the threshold for felony larceny was $250. Yeah. So, you know, someone picks up a, a sweater in a store or steals an iPhone and, you know, they have a felony that's attached to their record for life, which, you know, is a, a, is a great barrier for many things. Uh, so we tried to make some adjustments to that. Uh, we did things around um, bail. Uh, we wanted to make sure there was a recent court con uh, case. Uh, the Supreme Court came down with a case saying that no one should be incarcerated solely for an in inability to pay bail uh, or pay a fine or fee. Uh, and that was the Brangan decision, uh, where you have a person, you know, if, if your bail is $250 and you're poor, you're going to be incarcerated, which is certainly Until far more. Until the trial more, date, maybe. Yeah. Yes, yeah. pre-trial incarceration, you yeah. haven't been found guilty yet. Uh, we know that in the House of Corrections, if you're held on those type things, you know, it averages $55,000, $57,000 a year. So, yeah. you know, a person could be held and it's far more costly to, to hold them uh, than to provide them a, a way to maybe not pay that $250 or whatever. And then we went on to uh, how we treat our prisoners when they're in prison. We made uh, changes to the way we handle solitary confinement. Uh, we made uh, some changes relative to uh, if a person is dying in prison and they pose no threat to anyone. I mean, we have prisoners who are in our prison systems that are in vegetative states. Uh, and maybe, you know, there is a mechanism for what we would call a compassionate medical release. Yeah. So you can come to it, you know, from whatever whatever is the motivation. For some people, they feel it's compassionate and is, that... A person should die in their own bed, and other people look at it and say it's a heck of a lot cheaper. Yeah. Uh, so we did that, and then uh, we made some changes to mandatory minimum sentences. That's where the Senate bill and the House bill differed. Uh, we, you know, didn't extend any of those uh, to trafficking uh, because we recognize, you know, there are low-level uh, people that have addicts and addiction yeah. that are low, what we'll call a low level and And for drug people dealer. at home, it, then it goes to a conference committee and you have to iron out these differences. But, right, so but we had two bills, yeah. the House bill and the Senate bill. Lots of differences and in January we began the procedure of the conference committee. I led the negotiations on behalf of the House along with uh, Majority Leader Ron Mariano from Quincy and Representative Sheila Harrington, who is the minority member on the Judiciary Committee, who I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And then on the Senate side, um, my Senate co-chair, Will Brownsberger, and the majority leader on the Senate, Cindy Cream, and Bruce Tarr, who is the minority leader on the Senate. And we worked for three months uh, to iron out the differences. And there's a lot of minutia. You, you start out and uh, the Senate bill was 173 pages long. Ours was a little, I would say 136, and we ended up with about a 100 page bill at the end of it. Just uh, 100. Just 100 Just 100. Pages. So we, we touched on just about everything. And uh, you know, but it, it was a very strong bipartisan effort. Uh, when we had the House bill, we had a really strong vote. It was 144 to nine on our original uh, House bill, so you know, I was really proud of the fact that we were able to pull together uh, every Democrat in the House voted for the bill, as well as 26 out of 35 uh, members of the Republican Party, and including the whole Republican leadership team voted for this bill. And, and, and that's pretty remarkable when we see what goes on on the nightly news and Washington, D.C., and the Congress. I mean, for everyone to come together and yeah. understand the legislation support it and then put their name and their vote on it, I yeah. think uh, is a testament not only to your work, but the quality of the bill, the final product. Yeah. And that, that doesn't happen too often though. Let's no. not. We're not Washington. Yeah, no. no. But, but you don't usually 
have that kind of a, uh, an outcome. This, yeah. is, this was unusual that it had such no, and widespread. No, and honestly, I was really proud of the work of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, in particular, I was proud of uh, the so many members of the House that weighed in. I mean, it really was a remarkable endeavor, and it's one that I'm very proud of. I, th I think my mediator skills came in on this one because, trust me, there were a lot of disagreements. But at the end of the day, we came up with something uh, that everyone could get behind and support for the most part. And, and even though the governor had a couple of issues, which I guess he may still be working on in the in final analysis, he, he signed the bill. I think he recognized that this is a major step forward for the Commonwealth. He did. And, you know, that was always my goal, to get a bill to the governor's desk that he would be able to sign. And, you know, that was part of the challenge because we do have a two-party system and, you know, you have... Uh, things in the bill that, um, you know, some of the district attorneys originally had some concerns about some aspects of both bills, as did the sheriffs, and, you know, we worked together. And at the end of the day, one of the things that I'm also proud of is that when you talk about criminal justice reform, it's not just that we're going to give people a break. I mean, criminal justice reform uh, and we've seen this across the country, has come as a result of it's a desire to reduce recidivism, which we know it does. It increases public safety, and at the end of the day, it saves taxpayer dollars. So that was the goal. And when we established that goal, um, what we also wanted to do is make sure that when we talk about criminal justice reform, we talk about public safety. So even though we did give some breaks, on some of the mandatory sentences around low-level drug offenses, offenses, we recognize that we have, we are faced with an opioid crisis, and it's a public health and public safety crisis that we have never seen before. So we now in Massachusetts have the strongest car fentanyl law in the country, and one of the one of the strongest uh, fentanyl laws in the country. Uh, relative to trafficking. Uh, we also made moves to increase some of our penalties surround, surrounding operating under the influence. Prior to this bill, you would only be charged for operating under the influence up to the fifth offense. We created new offenses for six, seven, eight, and nine oh, okay. with increased yeah. penalties. Yeah. Uh, we looked out for victims. We have made uh, established ways to have more efficient uh, testing of rape kits. There are over, I mean, literally thousands of rape kits that have not been tested, yeah. and with that comes crimes that have not been solved. Yeah. Well, because everyone's starting to get into this CSI mentality mm -hmm. that, that every case should have some physical or scientific evidence, and I think uh, when you and I spoke about that the other day, number one, that could let an innocent person out of jail if the testing comes back and it right. exonerates them. But number two, it will hopefully get more people into the trial courts, right. have their trial heard, and if they're guilty, get them off the street and, and protect victims. So that's, uh, I think that's, that's very good. Yeah. I like the DNA part of that. And I'm sure the police will, too. Yeah, I know. Um, that was something the DAs were really concerned about because the way the law was before, um, you had to provide a DNA sample within one year of a conviction of a felony. And now we're saying, you know, you're going to provide that sample forthwith upon conviction or before you leave the House of Correction or DOC. You know, people okay, are walking yeah. out of the House of Correction and then have a year to provide their sample. Yeah. And at one point there were 20,000 samples that hadn't been obtained. I think now it went down to 12. But as we move forward, uh, that won't be an issue. So now training-wise, the police are going to have to learn a whole new procedure for juvenile offenders. Some of the judges will have to adjust, especially right. the juvenile court judges. The parole board is going to have to get used to some right. changes you made. So this is really going to spawn a, a continuing program of making everyone aware, the different constituencies aware of the changes that you've made and get right. them up to speed. And that's, I would think that will be uh, very yeah, interesting. Yeah, there'll, there'll be a lot yeah. said about that. And you know, there's a lot of things like when we find so many of the people that are incarcerated, uh, have mental health and substance abuse uh, issues. 
Uh, so a lot of what we're doing is around mental health and it starts on the juvenile end. We created a, a childhood trauma task force. Uh, one thing that was originally quite startling to me when we began this process is when we look at our juvenile justice system, 72% of the children that are in our juvenile justice system are con called what are called dual status youth. And that means that they are um, attached with another agency and that being Department of Children and Families. Okay. Yep. So you're looking at yep. the fact that you have 72% of these kids started out their life either abused or neglected and find themselves in the juvenile justice system. So that's why, you know, it's, I, I use this quote in my, uh, my speech on the floor about criminal justice system, uh, but it's one from Frederick Douglass, and I don't have it exactly, but it's something to the effect of it's far better, far easier to create strong children than fix broken men, something to that. A I don't have it exactly you know, off the top of my yeah. head, uh, but that's why we focused a, a huge amount of this uh, is on our juvenile justice system. So with the change from seven to 11 being the age where you would not get caught up in a criminal proceeding. Mm -hmm. um, I asked you the other day, and I, yeah. and I hope that the governor and everyone will follow through, there should be some mental health issues right. that can be addressed. DCF, I think, is going to have to really take a hard look at that age group now yeah. because you want to prevent them from reaching age 12 and then getting caught up in the, in the juvenile justice system. It's, yeah. I mean, you've got to take care of kids. Any society that doesn't, I think, is I know. woefully inadequate. And, it, uh, and what is really true is, you know, the, the data suggests that the earlier you are in the criminal justice system, the more likely you are to be incarcerated and later as an adult. And the longer we can keep kids out of the juvenile justice system and provide them with the help and services they need, the more likely they are to have success later in life. So it, it starts at that end. Well, I was going to jokingly say, what do you do for an encore? But I know there will be, <laughs> there'll be more bills filed, yeah. there'll be more criminal justice yeah. issues. Uh, anything on your immediate horizon that you would like to see uh, tackled now that this is kind of in place and uh, anything coming up in the Judiciary Committee that's going to be of, of interest? Yeah, well, we're still finishing out. Uh, we had over 800 bills, yeah. so criminal justice reform took up a huge amount of that, and we still have uh, some changes we're uh, making relative to potentially the probate system. Uh, we have some others uh, surrounding early education and care. Uh, we're working on those. Uh, but then I still also have my job as a, the state rep that represents that's, Brockton and Easton. And so we are constantly, you know, working uh, to fight for funding for our schools. We uh, keep you busy in Brockton. Yes. We do. Uh, we, we did a lot of nice things in the house budget by way of playgrounds. We got a lot of funding for playgrounds in Brockton. Uh, so that's we're, great. We're that's, looking forward yeah. to that. Uh, some funds from last year's budget are uh, going to be worked on very soon on the Hancock Playground. We had $100,000 uh, that we just received the money for. And then in this year's house budget, uh, we're also addressing some of the other playgrounds in the city. That's always good. We have the Secretary of Education coming to visit the Brockton Public Schools uh, because I, I felt it was very important that you know, it's one thing to look at us uh, by way of numbers, but I wanted him to come into our schools and see the challenges we face. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking forward to that visit as well. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming in. I, I'm sure we'll be talking about this again and talking about it for a while. I'd like to thank everyone for watching this evening. It's been a pleasure to host Representative Claire Cronin, the first woman to be chair of the Committee on the Judiciary in the Massachusetts State Legislature. We hope you found this program interesting and informative, and we thank you for joining us.